So what we just saw is the weakest moment of Putin's regime. Not only for the entire war, for, for more than a decade, ever since he first got in power in the midst of the Second Chechen War. This is the weakest he has ever been. It's good stuff, man. It's good stuff. Okay, let's get into talking about what just happened. So, as we're talking right now, Wagner seems to be pulling out of Rostov, the 11th biggest city in Russia, a city of what i think like 1.1 million people a major logistical hub to supply the russian army in donetsk and luhansk it has gigantic ammunition store uh, storage you've got airfields there they're finally pulling out of it after they made a uh, a a lightning bolt a usain bolt charge towards moscow they're pulling out with locals cheering them on here look at this <laughs> And Fergozin is also pulling out. He is leaving the Southern Military District HQ, which they took a hostage during this operation. You see that in this footage here. Uh, he's pulling out. And we've had a lot of chaos in the last 24 hours. And there's a lot of information to go through, a timeline that needs to be established because there's so much stuff being posted on Twitter, so much stuff being posted on Reddit, Discord, and all, and all the social media apps. Telegram especially, there's a ton of disinformation and nonsense being spread around. I even got tricked at least once by uh, some tele some fake Telegram messages that are being pumped out as the information war is 100% on and it's more aggressive than ever. So how did Wagner occupy the 11th largest city in Russia, a city of 1.1 million people, do it in under 24 hours and then get to the brink of capturing the Russian capital of Moscow? How did this happen? Shooting down helicopters and planes along the way so that this image right here, which is which shows Wagner's allies and opponents, its allies include the Russian armed forces from 2014 to 2023, and its opponents include the armed forces of Ukraine and now the Russian armed forces. How did this image become reality? So now this is the Wikipedia description to Wagner. It, it's pretty confusing. Because it's a private military company, the dynamics of, of internal domestic Russian politics are very complicated. But the bare bones reason why this is happening is that under the surface of the Russian armed forces, infighting and division between private military companies and different factions is only getting worse as the war continues to run into failures and people have to be picked and chosen for who's going to get priority when it comes to you know logistical supply resources artillery shells you get the idea so let's start from the top early yesterday Prigozhin released a message on telegram we're going to read this message in its entirety this has been clarified and i do believe this is a correct clarification i um, mean not correct clarification a good this has been defined as and i think this is a good way to define it this has been defined as Prigozhin's declaration of war against the Russian MOD, the Russian Ministry of Defense. Why is it specifically the Russian Ministry of Defense and not the Russian government as a whole? We'll get into that in a moment. But let's read the message. PMC Wagner Commander's Council made a decision. The evil brought by the military leadership of the country must be stopped. The negligent, uh, they neglect the lives of soldiers. They forgot the word justice, and we will bring it back. Those who destroyed today our guys, who destroyed tens and tens of thousands of lives of Russian soldiers, will be punished. I'm asking, no one resist. Everyone who will try to resist, we will consider them a danger and destroy them immediately, including any checkpoints on our way and any aviation that we see above our heads. Remember this line because it was eerily true. I'm asking everyone to remain calm. Do not succumb to provocations and remain in your houses. Ideally, those along our way do not go outside. After we finish what we started, we will return to the front line to protect our motherland. Presidential authority, government, Ministry of Internal Affairs, Rosgardia. This is like a police militia. It's kind of complicated, but it's 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 like a police militia, whatever. Anyway, and other departments will continue operating as before. We will deal with those who destroy Russian soldiers. We will return to the front line. Justice in the army will be restored. And after this, justice for the whole of Russia. Now, 
after he read out this message, Wagner troops then started marching on. And at the time it was unconfirmed because Wagner, and this was really, this shocked me. They were top tier in informational security. They were not posting selfies. They were not posting their location or like live streaming. And they were top tier in informational security. The only way we would get footage of them doing what they were doing and marching these columns on Rostov, uh, and we'll show you guys where Rostov is. I think it would make sense to use the live UA map for this because it might show some of the uh, notifications. Uh, no, it's not the live UA map. This is the deep state map. I prefer this map. Um, they marched on Rostov with very good informational security and they took the city. They took it over and they did it posting no information online. So we didn't know it was true until it was already too late. And they take it over the military HQ, administrative buildings, etc. You get the idea. And this is the type of footage we were getting of Rostov of armored carriers out on the street, hoping that they can hold back the Wagner tide. But once Wagner got there, and this was something we saw time and time again, and here's just a picture I posted of you know, the boys on the street and 1990s Russia, because, you know, in the 90s in Russia, there were a lot of coups and, you know, it's 90s Russia's all over again. Once they got there, everybody just kind of did nothing. The police let them through. When they crossed the border from Ukraine into Russia, the border guards basically dropped their guns and jumped into the bushes. We got actually photographs of these border guards and of Russian soldiers just, just standing there no longer with guns in their hand, just watching as Wagner goes by. Uh, a lot of the National Guard and Rosgardium units, the police units, as they approached the city, they just backed off. And I know there's been a lot of speculation as to why exactly all these units just kind of caved, because this wasn't an army of 10 to 20 to 30, 40,000 people, an unstoppable army, probably maximum a couple thousand. Right. And if that's being a little generous, honestly, a couple thousand people max taking a city of 1.1 million. Reminder, it took tens upon tens of thousands of people to capture Bakhmut, a city of 70,000. The reason why I don't think they resisted, and I've got a, I've got a few reasons as to why I don't think they resisted. But the first reason is I think they have a lot of sympathies for what Wagner was complaining about. We're going to get to that in a moment. And we're going to talk about those sympathies uh, in a second. But the other reason and we can talk about this right now, we're gonna to get to that other point in a moment, is that Wagner is a private military company full of criminals, murderers, rapists, and experienced fighters from Syria, uh, Libya, the Central African Republic, and some of the most brutal asymmetrical warfare that Russia has engaged in across the globe. And they're in a private military company where they're getting better pay than the average soldier and have been, I don't want to say groomed, but they have been, let's say, taught strong loyalty through a sledgehammer, gaining a reputation for beating their own men to death with sledgehammers if they don't obey orders. That's a real thing that happened. They are very open about that. They even joke with sledgehammers all the time, putting their logo on it, and they upload videos of them beating people to death with sledgehammers. And that's on top of the war crimes they've committed to other people, which include beheadings, castration of POWs. So imagine some of the most war-hardened people of the war are marching towards your city. And then the government tells you to go out on the street and stop them, set up a blockade as a cop. A cop who's probably never seen combat before, never went to you know Ukraine to fight a war. Maybe you're a local National Guardsman, Rosgardia, who knows? And you're supposed to stop one of the most war-hardened unit of the war, which you might even have sympathies for, who has a reputation for beating those who disagree with them or don't follow orders to death with sledgehammers. When you put it in that perspective, it's not that hard to imagine why someone would be like, screw this, I'm going home. Okay, so let's keep it moving. So they go there, they take over the city. It's a big shock. There's a lot of confusion. Russian state media outlet TASS, at first they published that those were Wagner soldiers that were in the city. Later they said, no, that's actually National Guardsmen. Later they reversed on it again. They eventually, I think they eventually admitted that, okay, they were Wagner fighters. And Yegeny Prigozhin 
then recorded a message in the now occupied city of Rostov. And he said, we lost huge amounts of territories in Ukraine. The Russian losses in Ukraine are three to four times higher than what the Russian high command says, up to a thousand casualties a day. Here's the English translation of what he said while at the HQ of the Southern Military District. Um, I'm just going to read the subtitles because I know many of you, most of you don't speak Russian. We are at the HQ of the Southern Military District, 7.30 in the morning. Military objectives in Rostov are under control, including the airfield, planes that leave for battle, work in Ukraine. They're leaving normally. There are no problems. Medical planes are leaving. No problems. All that's being done is we are taking control to ensure assault aviation does not control strikes on us. So they took over an airfield at Rostov as well. And the reason they did it is because they knew that the Air Force could be used to bomb them. And Wagner does not have an extremely strong control. They do have pilots, but they don't have extremely strong control of the Air Force. That was something that Putin probably had an advantage of, an advantage over them on. But they had a lot of anti-air weapons, as would be realized by the Russian Air Force, as many of their planes would start falling out of the sky. Anyway, let's continue. The main command of the headquarters is operating normally. There are no problems. Not a single officer has been removed. So when they will tell you that Wagner PMC has interfered with the work and something fell apart on the front line, that is not the cause of the front line falling apart. Oh, by the way, they knew in advance that one of the main complaints that they would get, which makes sense from a Russian nationalist perspective, is that causing chaos within the country undermines the war effort and it could lead to them losing the war. And so he his, his argument is, look, we're not interfering with the front line. We're not interfering with any of the aviation that are bombing the Ukrainians. We hope you kill all the Ukrainians in the world. That's what he wants, of course, not me. We, but we are just trying to come here to cleanse the military of its ineptitude and corruption. When we arrived here, we again confirmed a lot of these new things. Huge parts of the territories have been lost. Numbers of killed soldiers is three to four times more than what is being reported in the documents to the top. I think one of the things that really pissed off the Russian government about how he did this is as he did this, forgoes it, even though, of course, dude, dude, is, a, dude is shifty, you know, he's a snake in the grass to an extent. Uh, you know, he, there's, it's not easy to become a caterer, which that's what he used to be, by the way. Uh, Prigozhin used to be a caterer for Vladimir Putin and then become basically a warlord without having some, um, good maneuvering skills politically and mili uh, not militarily necessarily. Most of that is managed by people like Utkin, but he, you know, he's a, he's a slick cat, I guess you could put it. Uh, but one of the things that I think is really bothering them is a lot of the things he said is just true. Like, hey, we're taking much more casualties than what the MOD is letting on. We're having much more failures than what the MOD is letting on. There's a lot more problems in the Ukrainians uh, than they are letting on. And the Ukrainians could have a lot more success than the Russian government would let you think. So the I think another reason why the Russian government hated this so much is a lot of the things he was saying was also just verifiably true, which made it sting more. <laughs> And what gets reported to the top is 10 times more than what is being said on television. Total casualties are up to 1,000 people on some days. There are killed, missing, wounded, and the so-called refuseniks who refuse not because they're cowardly, as I said before, but because they have no choice, no munitions, no command. That munitions thing, we're going to come back to that. The chief of the general staff, Gerasimov, this is one of the people he wanted to have a quote-unquote sit-down conversation with, ran away from here as soon as he found out that we are approaching the building. So there was two people that he specifically has been targeting during this campaign. Gerasimov, which is a high-ranking Russian general who has been involved in managing the war, and the other person is Shoigu. He's the Minister of Defense for the Russian Federation. That's another person him and many Russian nationalist and military bloggers have been lambasting as one of the main reasons they're failing the war is because of their mismanagement. But they're also very close allies of Putin and the Suroviki, like the security state of the Russian government, the old guard. Okay, so that was a statement he released, um, but people also went out and started talking to Wagner fighters. And this is, I think, where we can talk about why Wagner is doing this, the deeper 
interest that kind of led to this. So there was an interview in a Wagner fighter who had just taken Rostov and, you know, residents and journalists were like, why are you marching on Russian cities? What's going on? And he said, ammunition. That's why. Let's listen. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll do the whole thing where I'm, uh, I'll quote unquote translate, even though I'm just reading subtitles. I'm a fighter of the PMC Wagner, currently in Rostov. Wagner Company, or rather Wagner Group, always stood for the protection of the interests of the Russian state and people. Protected the interests of the president. We were always loyal to him. We still are. We came here not to fight, but to find truth, receive the ammo that we were not given in the special military operation zone. We are not going to fight anyone here. We just need ammo. People who support us, I'm asking you to come here, the center of Rostov, and support us, as for some reason we were declared terrorists and that we must be destroyed. We're going to talk about the Russian government's response to this in a little bit. So we need your help. Come and support us. So he is hitting on something that has been been a long-standing theme we've been covering on this channel, and that is the internal strife behind the Russian armed forces. Now, Russian volunteers, that is like people who deliver aid to soldiers, Russian soldiers, you know, uh, gas masks, fresh boots, fresh socks, tourniquets, uh, scope sights, night vision, helmets, stuff like that. Stuff that they can't afford to buy themselves, but the Russian army army is, is lacking in. Many of them have come forward on Telegram, and they're not the only ones. Many have brought this forward and talked about how infighting within different private military companies with the MOD, with the VDV, and all these different groups who are all fighting in uh, Ukraine, uh, LPR soldiers, that's Luhansk People's Republic, DNR soldiers, Donetsk People's Republic, DPR, sorry, Donetsk People's Republic. These are like the proxy states the Russian government has, has made in Ukraine. All these fighters are infighting. They don't trust each other. They don't uh, believe that the other sides are doing enough to win the war. A lot of times we'll emphasize all the good that they do for the war effort while everybody else is not doing enough for the war effort. And communication between a lot of these units has broken down, which is a problem if, for example, an LPR unit has to hold the flank of a Wagner group unit and they're not communicating. One group gets attacked, they try to get help, and now the, the people who are protecting their flank isn't going to be able to shell them, shell the attacking Ukrainians in time to help them, or they're not going to be able to organize a counterattack in time to regain the position. And this has become a deeper problem. Why is there infighting? Well, it's pretty complicated, but I can highlight a few issues. Um, one of the things that the Russian MOD has been clashing with with Wagner has to do, as this soldier highlighted on and, and uh, Prigozhin has highlighted on on multiple occasions, is ammunition shipments, is supply lines. Uh, Wagner has claimed, specifically Prigozhin, on many occasions that Wagner has been getting strangled when it comes to supplies, ammunition, uh, but mostly shells, artillery shells, tank shells, stuff that lobs iron at the Ukrainians. They're saying, and Prigozhin more specifically, that the Russian Ministry of Defense is purposely uh, keeping the weapon shipments to Wagner low to stop them from having more military achievements and to undermine them because they're outshining the Russian MOD and the regular armed forces. They're outshining uh, Surovikin, uh, not Surovikin, they're, uh, they're outshining Gerasimov, they're outshining Shoigu, and so they need to undermine them because they're also, uh, uh, you know, have there's a domestic political angle where uh, the MOD does not want Prigozhin to gain too much favor, too much influence, and be more powerful than them. Um, now, I think from these actions, maybe they had some justification for those concerns. Not moral justification, but like st strategic Machiavellian justification when it comes to, you know, jostling for power. And so that was one of the big complaints, that they weren't getting proper ammunition storage. Now... This isn't the first time they came to a head on this. I don't know if many of you guys remember this, but Wagner actually threatened to pull out of Bakhmut 
during the later stage of the battle for the urban center because of these lack of ammunition shipments. And Prigozhin very angrily released a video on camera in front of tons of dead Wagner soldiers saying these guys were killed by Shoigu. These guys were killed by Garisimov. These guys were killed by the Russian Ministry of Defense because they won't give us the tools necessary to take Bakhmut and to help these guys fight the good fight without getting themselves killed. Right now, that should have been a flare. That should have been something that, you know, I think the international press maybe should have paid a little bit more attention to. We covered it on this channel to the best of our ability. Uh, but when that was happening, you know, it was starting to get worse and worse and worse as the rhetoric escalated. But it wasn't just ammunition that caused this because the ammunition issue wasn't a tipping point. It was already a problem for months up to this point. What seemed to be the tipping point, and we're going to get to what set this off, but what I think was the actual tipping point, and most analysts I think agree with this, is contract negotiations. That Wagner had uh, had to engage with contract negotiations uh, with the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense, and the new contract that was being pushed on Wagner and other PMCs would have centralized more control with the Russian Ministry of Defense, taken away a lot of power from Prigozhin, and boxed him out. And it seemed that he had lost that fight with him uploading videos, trying to like hand them the documents and complaining about the terms, but saying he's still doing it, but obviously very upset about these contract negotiations and the amount of power that was being taken by the Russian, Russian Ministry of Defense as they tried to centralize power because of this infighting with Wagner and other PMCs. And so it's at that point that many people now speculate that Prigozhin started planning started thinking about fallback plans, started thinking, dang, if we get boxed out, I don't want to be thrown out of no window. Or man, I don't want to lose my private military corporation. I kind of like this private military group. Hell, I helped found it with Dmitry Utkin, the neo-Nazi. What am I going to do? And that's when Prigozhin started scheming. Most likely, of course, he hasn't said this up publicly, but this type of thing doesn't just happen overnight a lot of times. I, th I, I believe he did some scheming. Now, eventually, there, was, had, there had to be something to set this off. And what set this off was a missile, according to Wagner, that was fired from a Russian MOD position and killed Russian, uh, 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 Russian soldiers fighting with the Wagner group. Killed Wagner group boys. And, they, and Wagner saw this as an ultimate betrayal. They uploaded some footage of after the strike. And that's what set this all off. And actually, uh, Prigozhin referenced it in his quote-unquote declaration of war. The thing is about this, though, that is pretty interesting, and Elliot Higgins of Bellingcat points this out, but he isn't the only person to point this out. And I talked about this on the NAFO stream and, all, and on other uh, interviews as well, is that we don't even know that the Russian MOD did this. I mean, the only evidence that Wagner ever provided that the Russian MOD struck the position was the immediate aftermath of the strike. I'm not saying that it's impossible. I'm not saying that it's fake, we don't know. But since there hasn't been sufficient evidence provided, there is a real possibility that this strike on Wagner didn't even happen. And if you listen, like not didn't even happen, but it wasn't MOD, or that it was some sort of false flag. And I'm not saying that's 100% true. I'm just saying we don't know. Everything is still blurry. Maybe the history books will tell us in the future what happened. Maybe they won't. Maybe it'll be a mystery forever. Either way, the Russian MOD denied it. But this was the thing that actually set off all the clashes. Now, what was really interesting as the Wagner Group entered Rostov was not only the fact that the border, gu border guards didn't stop them, the police didn't stop them, the National Guard didn't stop them, the Rosgardia didn't stop them. It was also the reaction from the population in Rostov. Many of them walked up to Wagner and thanked them. Thanked them. Now, this was not the majority of people. Most people just kind of gawked and stared and was, you know, kind of shocked what was going on maybe, but they didn't really say anything or do anything. Many just went about their day. There was a lot of photos being published of street sweepers that were street sweeping like right next to these Wagner soldiers who were just kind of like milling about waiting for the next move, for Gozen's next order and, and protecting the uh, city center of Rost uh, Rostov from any counterattacks, from any central government loyalist forces working on behalf of Gerasimov, Shoigu, or Putin. 
uh, but the but there were real supporters of what Wagner was doing and that their crusade against the mismanagement of the Russian Ministry of Defense was something that they believed in. Uh, here, here's just one example. Now, maybe they're just doing it because they're there and they're being nice to them. But I, I have to believe that some of the people who did this believed it. <laughs> You are fighting for us. We are here for you, lads. Nice one, bro. But don't start anything aggressive. You support us. Respect for this. But let's do it without aggression and chaos. No one needs this, gentlemen. This is not the man to be attacked. Exactly. No need to be aggressive to the people. Let's have fun. Communicate. Let's have fun. No need for aggression. So the locals didn't seem to be in a mood to pick up Molotov cocktails and throw them out of their cities. Uh, and this isn't the only video. There's other ones like this. Wagner, Wagner, nice lads. So that guy really liked Wagner. Uh, and there's one more video I guess I could show of this. This is when uh, uh, Wagner was about to leave Rostov and go back to Ukraine. These are people in Rostov cheering Wagner, shaking their hands, you know, like, yay, Wagner, look at this. So as you can see, it, that was in Moscow. No, no, no. This is in Rostov. This is in Rostov. Um, and while in Rostov, Prigozhin did sit down with a three-star general um, and start, quote-unquote, negotiating with him. This is a high-ranking military brass. But something that's interesting about this interaction is you see this guy to the left here as the government enters, quote-unquote, negotiations with uh, Prigozhin. This guy to the left, assumedly a colonel, tries to, like, give a comment, and Prigozhin immediately cuts him off, like, why are you speaking to me to, like that? When you speak to me, you speak to me with respect. And you don't need to speak Russian to see the tone of his voice and see that he's not happy. And the, the guy on the left is like, ooh. <laughs> so to be to be gentle about it he had him by the balls and he had him by the balls early right sorry to put it that way but it's also uh a fact so um this is all going down everything's i'm not gonna say everything's really falling apart but things are getting chaotic and eventually the russian government responds uh, and it's the FSB that responds, and Russian state media kicks in the overdrive. They start taking down all of Prigozhin's social media accounts as quick as they can, and they're plastering every Russian state media news outlet with Prigozhin. Gay? Not, not, but not like that specifically, but you get the idea. Prigozhin, what the, he's backstabbing the country, yada, yada, yada. I mean, look at all these headlines. Prigozhin, charged with armed mutiny to face up to 20 years in prison. That's an FSB charge, by the way. Criminal case opened against Wagner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these different posts, um, you know, getting angry at Wagner for uh, this challenge to the Russian MOD. Uh, but uh, that was not it, though. It was also Putin's time to shine because Putin comes out and he starts giving a statement as well. And if you go and you listen to how uh, uh, Prigozhin talks about this coup, he was always careful to make sure that he specifically concentrated on the Russian MOD. He concentrated on uh, Gerasimov, and he concentrated on Shoigu, and maybe some other staff. Um, that's what th Those were the people that he concentrated on. 
and criticizing and saying we're the problem. He never, ever came out with any statement like we are going to overthrow Putin or we're going to get rid of Putin or anything like that because he knew that he probably could not get away with that. It seems that the bet was that maybe if he moved fast enough and Russia's resources were stretched too thin and, I mean, his theory seemed to be eerily close with reality, uh, that they would be able to force the Russian government uh, to give them more leverage in negotiations and give them a better deal. Not because he wants to take over the country and become the next czar or something to replace Putin, but because he wants more resources or any number of things due to the recent clashes that they've had with the Russian MOD. And so he's been very careful in his statements to not go after Putin much directly and to not say he's going to he's going to overthrow Putin because there's a lot more critique and hatred of Shoigu and Gerasimov than there is of Putin in Russian society. So he wanted to isolate it so it'd be easier to make people be like, well, you know, maybe as a point. And maybe that's part of the reason why there was some public support and a lot of Russian soldiers stood down. But eventually, Putin responded. He was angry because, well, obviously, a coup of his allies and of his government, even if it's not going to be him directly being removed from power, is not something he likes. It's something that makes his regime look weak and what uh, and his and his rules and, and what he wants in the country and his orders makes him look weak. Uh, and so he says uh, that, hey, this is betrayal. This is horrible. And let me just read what he what he said with the statement he put out. The battle for the fate of our people against the West needs unity. Thus, actions dividing us are a betrayal of our brother in arms. So he's calling what Prigozhin doing a betrayal. Uh, and I guess to him it might feel like a betrayal because, again, Prigozhin used to be his caterer until he became head of Wagner. A strike to the back of our people, like in 1917. So he's, he's saying that the communist revolution was a betrayal to Russia, and this is a betrayal to Russia. I wonder how the marxist led are going to respond to that, the hardcore tanky types. When our country was divided, we will not let this happen. It's an internal betrayal. And that's not all he said. He went on to say this as well. They're pushing us to defeat and capitulation, a strike against Russia, our people. Our actions will be brutal. Listen to that. Our actions will be brutal. Everyone who consciously went on this path will take an immediate punishment. Remember this. Our actions will be brutal. Everyone who consciously went on this path will take an immediate punishment. All departments have been instructed. Additional anti-terrorist measures are being introduced in regions in Moscow. Operation of, civ of civil and military departments in Rostov are challenging. As a citizen, I will do everything to protect the Constitution and the people. Those who are responsible, who, those who started the mutiny, betrayed Russia, and will be held responsible. The only right choice is to lay down arms. So Putin comes out and he puts his uh, puts his hat in with uh, Shoigu and with Gurusimov, at least with the Russian MOD against this coup. He doesn't want to look weak. He doesn't want to send the message that you can do a coup and then Putin will concede to you because what will that do? It will not only make his regime look weak and like it could easily be challenged, but it could possibly encourage behavior like this in the future. Not to mention the the image of instability it produces internationally will almost certainly make many Western allies like the United States uh, and the UK and Germany and, and the Western allies of Ukraine. It will certainly make them think that their economic pressure, that their political pressure and their military pressure uh, is working. So Putin sends out this statement. Shoigu finds out about the, not Shoigu, but Prigozhin finds out about the statement, and Prigozhin responds with an audio message saying, "No one will surrender to the demands of the president." This is when he directly challenged. I mean, the whole action, everything he's doing is a direct challenge. But this is when he verbally acknowledges and directly points to and states, "I am challenging the president." President. No one will surrender to the demands of the president in reference to Vladimir Putin. So this, again, is the furthest Prigozhin has ever gotten. He's now no longer just challenging uh, Gerasimov. He's now no longer just challenging Shoigu. He's now challenging Putin himself. Regarding the betrayal of the motherland, the president is deeply mistaken. We're patriots of our motherland. We fought and we are fighting all fighters of PMC Wagner, and no one is going to surrender to the demands of the president 
FSB, again, the FSB just put out the 20 year warrant on him or anyone else, because we don't want the country to live further in corruption, lies and bureaucracy. When we fought in Africa, we were told that we needed Africa, and then they dumped it because they stole all the money that was meant to come for help. And when we were told we are fighting with Ukraine, we went and fought. But it turned out that the ammo, weapons, and all the money put towards this were also being stolen. While officials are sitting and saving them for themselves for an incident that happened today when someone is going towards Moscow. Now they are not saving anything. They are striking us with planes and helicopters at the columns with civilians. And they hit civilians because they're missing. He's now saying that the Russian MOD is not only bombing Wagner, but is also killing Russian citizens. And they hit anywhere they can. Thus, we are patriots. But those resisting us today are those who are gathered around scumbags. So while this is a direct challenge, there's a lot of stuff that's interesting here. But while this is a direct pre uh, challenge to the president, he still goes in to say the president is mistaken. And so in my mind, I there's this idea uh, that has been kind of perpetrated. And it wasn't only in Russia that this idea per perpetrated. It was actually like uh, uh, like something the SS said. As well, this was a saying in the SS, and in the SS, the saying was, "If only the Führer knew." Is that any time you know they had ammunition shortages or food shortages or any of these horrible challenges in the war uh, against the Soviet Union, they would say, "Well, if if the Führer knew that we didn't have this food, if the Führer knew that we didn't have this ammunition." then, you know, obviously we'd be getting supplies and the Führer would never abandon his mighty, his mighty SS and his mighty Wehrmacht, right? Who are fighting the crusade against communism or whatever the hell Himmler or whoever would say. And in this way, even though I know World War II uh, analogies are overdone, uh, Prigozhin is leading into that as well here. But he isn't the first person to put forward the idea because you can see Russian military unit after Russian military unit recording videos out in the field saying, hello, hello, President Putin, we make an appeal to you. We don't have tourniquets. We don't have ammunition. We don't have boots. We don't have socks. I don't got dental floss. I don't got, I don't got uh, band-aids. I don't, you know, I, I left my Nintendo Switch. Please help us. Like, you see a ton of those videos getting released. And that's exactly the same thing of only the Fuhrer knew. And this is what Prigozhin is leading into. You are mistaken that Gerasimov and Shoigu and the Ministry of Defense are misleading, misleading Putin, and that when he's hiding in his bunker, wherever he is, he's being brought data sheets that he doesn't truly know. And he kind of plays into it a little bit more when he talks about we're losing a thousand soldiers a day and all this stuff, and I'm finding out the truth after occupying the HQ. He's, he's leaning into this narrative a lot. So in a way, even though Putin is directly challenging Prigozhin, and he is technically... Uh, and, you know, you know, Putin is saying we will make you pay. Uh, Prigozhin is technically challenging Putin, but he's also like saying, but uh, obviously Putin doesn't know. The Fuhrer doesn't know. And so he's able to guide the narrative in a very smart way, considering how isolated it would seem he would be in this, in what would now become his advance on Moscow. So after Putin basically says back down, Putin looks in the camera and says, me, bitch, M me, and starts marching at lightning speeds towards Moscow. And I'm telling you, I was getting updates like quickly, like, oh my gosh, they're only, they're 600 kilometers away, 500 kilometers away, 400 kilometers away. And then it was 200 kilometers away before eventually they actually entered the Moscow Oblast. Putin said back down and Prigozhin said no and then he marched on the capital and this this was the make or break moment and so the Russian MOD the FSB the National Guard uh, the police units uh, everyone started going into action in fact the Chechens and Katerov started taking soldiers out of Mariupol Mariupol and started sending it towards Rostov to try to take it back now, there were some reports of like, like explosions and shots being fired in Rostov, but we don't have any footage of the Chechens and the Wagner fighting, so we don't really know if they ever really clashed in the street, but we do know that they were supposed to march on Rostov. Not that I necessarily think that the Chechens being pulled out of Mariupol, and that's 
direct military resources being pulled out of Ukraine to then divert for this coup because they didn't have enough to deal with this coup in Russia itself, uh, which shows, again, how a coup like this could undermine the war effort uh, in Ukraine. But uh, he starts marching on the capital. Chechens getting called, uh, uh, national police getting called, and, and the MOD just scrambles, doing everything they can to try to stop their advance. Banners advertising Wagner were being ta torn down in Moscow uh, to make sure that, you know, they're not looking like they're endorsing their actions, trying to, you know, you know, take down the social media accounts, take down their banners. Uh, that's not the only thing they did. They also raided Wagner's headquarters in St. Petersburg, but nothing's being commanded out of their headquarters in St. Petersburg. They did, though, take a bunch of pictures of gold, American dollars, and, like, different IDs that Prigozhin had with different names in uh, in this headquarters to basically be like, wow, look, Prigozhin's a pretty shady guy. Prigozhin did respond to this while he was, you know, marching on Moscow uh, by just saying, yeah, I got a lot of money. And? I'm not kidding. That was his response. He said, yeah, I have a lot of money. And he, he went on to clarify that uh, the money that he has is specifically to pay people, like pay people in Wagner. He has paid people in Wagner in cash for a very long time. That's always how Wagner has operated. That's That was his justification, which, by the way, mercenary group that pays in cash, pretty shady stuff. Anyway, moving on, they tried to get ahead of the media narrative, uh, and this is how they did it. Uh, so this is a clip from Russian State TV. She says, now back from commercials. They just got back from commercials. And then they went back to commercials. The reason why they did this is they didn't know what to say. They didn't know what, what statements to put out and they hadn't been given directives from the Kremlin. And so they had basically resorted to just like long playing like uh, uh long playing uh, long playing commercials and i also saw one channel just playing like smooth jazz so it's not exactly the 1990s they're playing swan lake on tv during the coup but their version included smooth jazz so as close to it as you could get uh and as Wagner was advancing, the Russian Air Force tried to bomb them, and Wagner responded by shooting their planes out of the sky. Now, one second. I've got I had a list of the full uh list of planes that were shut down. So it's seven to eight aircraft. They seem to mostly be helicopters. This right here is probably the most important aircraft that was shot down. Uh this is one of the, the larger aircraft, more expensive aircraft, but they shot down seven to eight, mostly like MI8 helicopters, but yeah, no, this this was a, a pretty big loss for the Russian military. And we're going to get into how the Russian military is going to respond to this, because even if the coup has ended and we're still waiting for fallout, more stuff can happen. Um, how do you brush this under the rug that this happened? How do you let people off for this? They they killed Russian soldiers and airmen. One second, do we hear an explosion at the end? I actually don't know. Apparently not. Uh, they shot down those planes. And so obviously the Air Force wasn't enough to stop Wagner. And so they just started digging holes in the road. I'm not kidding. They started digging oh, holes I'm... in the road on the way to Moscow, hoping that the tanks and armored vehicles that were charging Moscow would see the hole and it would slow them down a little bit. So they were resorting to, to making unmanned tank traps in the middle of the road. Now, not only is this embarrassing that they resorted to this uh, and how and they were stretched so thin that they had to do this, but also afterwards, when it was all said and done, they had to do the more embarrassing task of filling in the hole that they had dug just one hour earlier. Anyway, the Russian MOD also wanted to be like, okay, so obvious, so it looks like their air force isn't working. It looks like our holes in the ground aren't working. Uh, our, our radar on their compound didn't work and us directly threatening Pergozin didn't work. So how about we put out a message to the people who are participating in the coup? Maybe we can convince them to switch back to our side. And so the Russian MOD released a statement 
and, and basically begging slash bargaining the Wagner fighters who are following Pergozin uh, into this coup, into this march, this like Napoleon esque march on Paris to switch sides. They put forward uh, five points. Number one, you have been tricked into Pergozin's criminal adventure and into participating in an armed rebellion. Number two, many of your comrades from several units have already realized their mistake, seeking help to ensure the ability to return safely to their permanent bases. We don't, we, I haven't seen any evidence of this. It could be true considering, you know, thousands of people, uh, but I just, I haven't seen any pictures ever provided that this happened. It could be true, or it may, but probably on a smaller scale. Um, this assistance has already been provided by us to all fighters and commanders who have requested it. Number four, Please show prudence and get in touch with representatives of the Russian Ministry of Defense or law enforcement authorities as soon as possible. And number five, we guarantee safety for everyone. Uh, TLDR, this appeal didn't work either. Uh, and what muddied the waters even more is that while these appeals were being released by the Russian MOD, there were videos being released of allegedly VDV fighters uh, from the Russians 217th VDV Regiment, occurred. switching sides. Serifex45 has donated $5. Thanks for all the content since this mess started. I'm glad you're showing what's happening on the ground, and I'm grateful to you for putting yourself in danger to show it. Thank you. I appreciate the $5. Um, I mean, so far since covering this, I haven't been in much danger. Right? I mean, there was that missile that passed over the house during yesterday's stream, but that's like, that's like, you know, that, that happens a lot more than you would think. So, I mean, I'm not in relative danger, but I, pre I do appreciate the sentiment. Thank you. Um, now, this video is still unverified. I have no clue if it's real or not. There's no proof that it's real. The guy's face is blurry. He doesn't show any official occurred. documents or anything like that. Callisto9092 has donated $10. Re, that accused strike on Wagner, is it conceivable it could have been Ukraine? And would they only make one strike on that position? Well, so, uh, first, I mean, I guess it's possible, but we have so little evidence of what happened besides one video in the aftermath, and the case was built so poorly that we literally don't know. It could have been a false flag. It could have actually been the Russian MOD. It could have been maybe Ukraine. It could, who knows who it was? Because all we have is afterwards, Wagner soldiers running around, like, breathing heavily. <laughs> And like point, pointing their camera at the strike sites, right? And like uh, some like, I think some like charred body parts, right? Th that's not enough evidence, right? I mean, it could be the case, but like, we don't know. But speaking of, we don't know for sure. We don't know if this was real. We don't know if it was not. It could be a VDV soldier legitimately switching sides, being like, I'm sick of the uh, Russian MOD. Again, there was a lot of sympathizers with them. That could be a, a factor. It also could be disinformation either from Prigozhin or possibly even maybe the Ukrainians thinking like, hey, the more chaos we can cause in Russia, the better. But we don't know for sure. Um, at this point, as Wagner is charging on Moscow, I get the image in my head, as, as I'm talking about it with my friend, of Prigozhin set up much like the guy from Mad Max, you know, the guy with the guitar that had the flames coming out the tip of it, that I would, I imagine he's at the tip of the spear, marching on Moscow, but instead of this guitar, he has the sledgehammer, and he's yelling, Shoigu! Shoigu! So that, that's where my mind is at this moment, if you want to know the type of thoughts I, I was, that were running through my mind, just imagining this all going down. Even though we don't actually know where Prigozhin was when this was going down, there's a good chance he was in Rostov when this was all happening. There's some rumors, not none of which are confirmed, that Utkin, the neo-Nazi, might have actually, who, who manages a lot of the military side of Wagner, might have actually been leading the charge. But we don't know for sure. Uh, anyway, moving on. As they approached Moscow, the, uh, the Moscow police started... Uh, trying to get into defensive positions around the city. They started trying to like uh, remove bridges or try to like uh, block bridges off, set up roadblocks anywhere they could. You can see here, uh, Ros Rosgardia troops, uh, police units, like a, like a, a police John de Marie, not John de Marie, but like almost like a police militia along a embankment near the road, an embankment near the road in Moscow. Uh, this is what they resorted to, just getting into defensive positions all across the city preparing for a possible direct attack or possible siege. 
the fact that there was a possibility that Siege of Moscow was a real like title of an event that happened during the Russian invasion of Ukraine is pretty insane. Didn't expect it would happen this way either. Also, I just saw this guy in this picture trying to just stand at the ground, and I imagine he was not feeling, you know, a lot of good vibes as this was going on, thinking, I'm going to have to fight the guys that beat people to death with sledgehammers. It's probably not the thing this cop thought he was going to be doing when he woke up today. Anyway, as they approach... No, sorry, there's just a lot of rain today. As they approached Moscow and they got closer and, and closer to uh, the, the uh, capital of the Russian Federation, we then got a statement from RA, RIA, which is Russian State News Outlet. So immediately I didn't necessarily believe it because it's from Russian State News. But the statement that they put out was, Prigozhin accepts Lukashenko's, and that really threw me for a loop, because there were some rumors that Lukashenko got on his plane and actually went to Turkey and he fled at the first sign of trouble. Same thing with Medvedev as well. But Prigozhin accepted Lukashenko's proposal to stop the movement of Wagner on the territory of Russia and further steps to de-escalate tensions, the press service of the Belarusian president reported. And I said when this happened, like, hey, let's wait. This is Russian state news, which is directly controlled by the Russian government. So if they wanted to cause like some confusion, this, this could be a motivating factor. Also, why would it be Lukashenko? But shortly after, also, I, I like this meme on Twitter. I just wanted to show it. It's not historically important. I just wanted to show it. it Lukashenko. Anyway, good job, Lukashenko. But it turned out to be real. And Prigozhin responded to this on Telegram with a recorded audio saying, it's over, basically. They were going to dismantle PMC Wagner. We came out on the 23rd of June to the March of Justice. That's what he's calling this, the March of Justice, not the coup of the MOD, but that you know, very, very nice, uh, nice way to put it. In a day, we walked to nearly... 200 kilometers away from Moscow. In this time, we did not spill a single drop of blood of our fighters. Listen to that. They did not spill a single drop of blood of their fighters. So they're saying that no Wagner guys died. Now, listen to the nuance there, because they're saying their fighters. Because the Russian Air Force, they lost some boys, right? So they're, they're trying to, you know, stay on the positive side. That, hey, at least none of us died, huh? None of us died. I mean, some of your, you know, we kind of probably killed like a, a Kurd bunch a of Kurd. Russian airmen, but we didn't die. Has donated $50. Hey, Zero. thank you. Thank you for the 50 bucks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Chippy on, uh, in gutter chat. Thank you so much for the primer. I appreciate it. I see a lot of people think, uh, like, like putting messages in chat for me to respond to, but let me get through the timeline first. Okay. There's, there's so much to get through here. Once you get through the timeline, then we can talk questions and I can respond to messages in chat. We did not spill a single drop of blood of our fighters. Now, the moment has come when blood may spill. That's why understanding the responsibility for spilling Russian blood on one of the sides, we are turning back our convoys and going back to field camps according to the plan. Now, the thing that gets me about this is Ru Russian soldiers already died. Like they were shot out of this. We see the plane. We see the plane crashing. The Russian sources say seven to eight Russian aircraft were shot down. Multiple helicopters and planes by by Wagner anti aircraft weapons. So blood was already spilled. I mean, obviously, like it intensifies the blood being spilled if they had to fight on the streets of Moscow. Uh, it would be a lot harder to sweep it under the rug. Right. Flemmy gifted three tier one subscriptions. So far, I did not hear about war crimes by Wagner in Russia. So all the war crimes in Ukraine are on purpose and not unruly soldiers. I, I mean, I, I, I would say that there's a chance that Prigozhin probably had a stronger grip on them this time for exactly the type of behavior they were engaging in such a risky operation. Um, but also, yeah, I do think the fact that they were dealing with Russians and not Ukrainians, probably impacted how they treated the civilian population. Thank you so much for this gifted three tier ones. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, anyway, let's... Uh, uh, now the moment has come with blood may spill. That's why, understanding responsibility of spilling Russian blood, we're going to go back to the field camp. So basically, he's saying, 
look, they were going to destroy Wagner. So this implies that he has saved Wagner. We came to the outskirts of Moscow. And now when we found out we were going to have to kill Russian soldiers more than we've already killed, we're going to back off and we're going to go back to our Wagner bases after succeeding in our quote unquote march of justice. And now the key of independent has released the details of the negotiations. It was put out by Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesperson, which is Putin's personal spokesperson. And the details of the deal that was struck are almost as confusing as the whole situation itself. Because this ended with Fergozin being let off essentially scot-free with a coup. He's the charges from the FSB, the 12 to 20 are dropped. The charges against everybody that are, that marched into Russia to participate in this coup, they will not be charged. Bel Lukashenko is not Lukashenko, Fergozin is going to be going to Luka, uh, to with Lukashenko over to Belarus now. In fact, he should be on like a plane shortly, if not already, headed towards uh, Belarus. Why exactly? I mean, it could be a type of exile where he can kind of live in peace with some of his most loyal followers. Maybe he's going to operate like Wagner Africa Corps. Maybe he's gotten pulled out. He's going to pull out his most loyal people and, and just concentrate on developing Wagner in uh, in Central Africa, maybe in Libya, you know, Syria, possibly Sudan, as that civil war is kicking off and getting more brutal before between the rapid support forces and the central government. Maybe that's it, but we don't know. We we, we still don't know exactly what's going to happen as Pergozin gets to Belarus. We're going to have to wait for further statements from him. But also, the people who did not go with him across the border into Moscow, uh, in trying to march on Moscow and take Rostov, they are still going to have to sign MOD contracts. And let, let's, let's read it right here. Uh, Peskov said that Wagner mercenaries who took part in the insurrection would not be persecuted. Those who refuse to participate will sign contracts with the Russian Defense Ministry. He said that reshuffles of the Defense Ministry haven't been discussed with Prigozhin. Wagner's founder has called for the dismissal of Defense Minister Shurgo, Shur, Sergei Shoigu and General Staff Chief Valery Gerasimov. The counterterrorism operation launched due to the rebellion will soon be ended. So Lukashenko negotiated a deal where Prigozhin stops the march on Moscow in return for him being able to go to Belarus in exile, maybe, or maybe to lead Wagner out of, uh, out of it, or the remnants of Wagner, whatever, is, whatever Wagner is going to be past this point, because in his original statement that Prigozhin, Prigozhin released, it seemed to be him implicitly saying that Wagner is going to survive this. Maybe he's going to manage Africa. Maybe he's in exile forever. Who knows? Maybe he's going with Lukashenko to engage in further negotiations because Prigozhin feels that if he's in Russia, he's more likely to be assassinated than if he's in Belarus. Because that's another angle to this. Don't assume just because Putin negotiated this deal or this deal was negotiated by Lukashenko that Putin is going to stick to his word or necessarily even uh, Prigozhin is going to stick to his word. Even though I do think it's more likely that Putin goes back on his word once he's in a more secure position he's and he's able to maneuver more safely since right now everything's still a little bit dicey everybody's still on edge right there's still a chance that uh putin like 72 hours from now is like you know what raid the houses of all of the wagner loyalists uh get bring me uh Prigozhin from belarus round up the people who are involved in the it's possible that he does that in the future because he did go pretty hard saying that the people will be punished the people will uh feel the fury of the russian government and then those guys asked him saying that kill a bunch of russian airmen and now they're going to get off scot-free that makes putin not only look incredibly weak couldn't this encourage this type of behavior in the future when russian forces are already stretched thin as we can see from this incident what if another private military company or somebody else, some general gets the idea of like, well, it only took a couple thousand Wagner boys to take Rostov and then march on Moscow. I have access to even more soldiers and, I, and I've already gotten more commanders to agree with me. Or maybe I've, you know, I got 10,000. If they could do this with a few thousand, what could I do with 10,000 soldiers marching on Moscow, taking these, taking the buildings, taking over the government, maybe, hmm. There's going to be oligarchs that are going to look at this and say, wow, man, it didn't take a lot to threaten Putin. Maybe we should 
you know, think of contingency plans. And so this does make Putin look weak. He calls them rebels, calls it an insurrection, says he's going to, they're going to feel the fury of the government. And then they negotiated everybody getting their time off and being able to basically get off of this scot free. Even if Prigozhin isn't going to get every single thing that he wants. I mean, it, it, it makes him look incredibly weak. The Russian government and Putin's government specifically, his regime has never looked weaker. Anyway, let's continue. Um, sorry, this is just a good meme. <laughs> it's weird because all these airmen are dead, right? And this is going to be the Russian government and Wagner's way forward. They're just going to pretend none of this ever happened. Now, there's still going to be a ton of talk behind closed doors. Russian society is not going to forget just what happened. People are obviously talking about it, uh, just not even just on social media, but also just, you know, on the street corner and in the bars and in homes and living rooms. People are discussing this. Uh, it's impossible to cover this up, but they're going to pretend it never happened. Peskov, for example, again, Putin's press secretary, he released a statement describing the uprising in which Wagner shot down helicopters, planes, captured a major command post, and marched most of the way on Moscow as a quote-unquote fairly difficult and full of tragic events, but said there were higher goals of escaping bloodshed and internal confrontation, and Putin will make no further comment on the issue. The invasion of Ukraine will continue as normal. And this is not just being pushed once. This is going to be the general narrative pushed about this by the Russian government moving forward with this message being uh, broadcasted on a big uh, electronic screen in uh, Moscow. And, uh, well, no, 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 this is, wasn't in Moscow. This was Moscow. This was in Rostov. It was on the arena, like their sports arena in the 1.1 million, uh, uh, million population city. And on this uh, electronic sign, it said, we are all one people and are fighting with the same external enemy. So the message that we're supposed to take away from this, or at least Russians are supposed to take away from this is, don't kill each other, kill the Ukrainians. That's the message. That's the message they want you to take away from this. Um, now, other than the Russian government's official spot response, another interesting response to this has been the Wagner people. Because if I was the Wagner people, even if this isn't the best deal in the world, I would still feel like, wow, I can't believe we got away with this. I can't believe there's a shot where we're actually going to get away. You know, we might actually survive. We're not going to prison. And, and I would be waiting to see the full details that are released. But a lot of the Wagner hardliners, the people who are the most loyal to Prigozhin, the people who are most loyal to Wagner and most believe that Gerasimov and Shoigu must pay for wasting the lives of the Russian soldiers and that a most of more effective and more brutal war, a more inhumane war must be fought against the Ukrainians. They're not happy. They're not happy at all. And they're not happy because Prigozhin did this. They're not happy because Prigozhin didn't go far enough. Can you believe that? They believe he didn't go far enough. I can understand a Ukrainian wanting that. Like, oh, I wanted to see Streety fighting on the streets of Moscow. But they think they should have gone further and actually taken Moscow and grabbed uh, Gerasimov and, and Shoigu and, and all these people by, 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 the, by, by their hair and, and just drag them through the street. Listen to what this guy says. This is a pro-Wagner social media account. The channel returns to its classic state. There will be no more editorial policy from the Patriot group here. Got involved with idiots. It could happen to anyone. In fact, everyone promised a policy with dubious prospects. In fact, they expected him to order the withdrawal of troops from Moscow. Next, it will be cleaned up. In principle, he was bred in the same way as the crest bred Paipu in Istanbul. Istanbul. Now we can say the three points that he was promised. Number one, resignation of Shoigu. We do not know this for sure. This is speculation. This is r rumor. It would be interesting if he did get the resignation of Shoigu. If he did, that's a massive victory for Wagner and a massive L for the MOD. Number two, amnesty for musicians. Number three, 
Oppor uh, that, that means the Wagner boys. That's what they call the Wagner boys. Number three, opportunity to return to Africa. This is what we talked about earlier, that Fergozin gets to concentrate on developing Wagner operations in Libya, maybe Sudan, Central Africa, Syria. You get the idea. I am sure that he, in fact, signed his own death warrant. Well, PMC Wagner, of course, too. So this guy is saying that by accepting whatever deal that was promised, and this is the deal that he is saying is being promised, but it's still rumor, uh, that Prigozhin has signed his own death warrant, that he is, he is, he is a dead man walking. Prigozhin dishonored not only himself, but everyone who believed in him. I still hold on only because I survived the murder of two brigade commanders in the shame and betrayal of the Minsks. This is in reference to the Minsk agreements, uh, which were negotiated between Russia, Ukraine, Western leaders to try to... It, it, it's kind of it's kind of hard to describe the missing agreement. Basically, they were trying to have a ceasefire that would extend into a peace, but it all fell apart. Uh, this was years ago. And here comes another blow. I will become even more cynical and perhaps never again believe in anything. Uh, but they aren't the only people who responded to this in a doomer fashion. One of the uh, people I do want to point out is Igor Gherkin. Igor Gherkin is a Russian war criminal, former FSB agent, former minister of defense for the DPR, the Donetsk People's Republic, the Russian proxy state that was developed uh, in uh, occupied uh, uh, Russian Donetsk. Uh, he also was involved in the invasion and annexation of Crimea, admitting on a talk show that he held... Crimean politicians at gunpoint and forced them, forced them at gunpoint to secede from Ukraine. He's also been involved in the shooting down of civilian airline, airliners, and he's a very hardliner on this war. Uh, let's read to what he has to say here. Mm -mm. I am forced to admit with bitterness that the Russian Federation, he also has a very popular podcast. Sorry, I just want to put that out there. Um, the only, and I, I only mentioned that because his podcast is watched by a lot of Ukrainians I know, and every once in a while I will watch his podcast if I can get a translated version of it, um, because he is an incredibly strange man. He's very sometimes honest about the pickle that rushes in, but he's also pretty crazy. Uh, he also really, for context, that you guys should know this going into this, he does not like uh, Prigozhin. He has referred to Prigozhin in the past as a, I think it was a snake lying Jew was the words, I think it was a snake lion Jew, because Prokosin, I think, believe Prokosin's mother is Jewish. I am forced to admit with bitterness that the Russian Federation has come one step closer to its final and inevitable death. From now on, there are two presidents in the Russian Federation. The real president, Prokosin, and the nominal president, Putin. The main purpose of the nominal president is to periodically address the real president in a kneeling position with the question, what would you like, Victor? Never, even in the most nightmarish dream, could I imagine that I would see the shame and the death of my country. He believes this is the beginning of the inevitable death of the Russian Federation. Now, I'm going to be honest. I'm more reserved than him. Number one, I don't think Prigozhin has as much leverage now as he seems to indicate, unless he knows something that I don't about what was truly negotiated, and maybe Wagner's going to double in size. Uh, who knows, right? Because again, in the next 72 hours, we could all find out that uh, Prigozhin is hanging from a lamppost, right? We won't know. Well, if it's Russian, then probably falls out of a very high, uh, uh, you know, hotel, very high building, very high uh, hotel building. But I, I think his thing is even much more doomer than I would uh, project for how this is going to affect the Russian Federation. But just to give you an idea of how Russian, some Russian nationalists are reacting to what's going on. Um, they aren't the only people who are reacting to this, though, because obviously with the war going on, Ukrainians are reacting to this. This war, uh, this incident, if we're going to call it, well, you know, let's not call it that, let's call it a coup. This coup could undermine the legitimacy of the Russian government, uh, degrade its central control over the country, make Putin look incredibly weak. He has never looked weaker, um, increases the infighting uh, amongst the Russian government. Uh, makes it so a lot of oligarchs and others who are, you know, looking for a way out of this war or maybe thinking about maybe Putin has to go and he's kind of putting us in, in the suicide mission of taking Ukraine. Like, there, there's a lot of negative effects it can have 
on the Russian war effort and on the Russian government as it conducts the illegal invasion of Ukraine. Not to mention, like I said before, this is only going to embolden the United States. This is only going, and I've already talked to people on Capitol Hill and they'll tell me, yes, this does embolden. This, not, not, they didn't say it that way, but they said, yes, we do believe that this is uh, in part a result of our government's pressure, political, economic, and military. This is gonna send that message not only to the United States, but the United Kingdom, to Poland, Estonia, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, everybody in NATO, everyone in the EU, uh, possibly the Koreans too. I mean, anybody who has in any way supported Ukraine, the Japanese, the Koreans, anyone, they're going to take this message to some extent that, wow, we started applying this pressure after they invaded Ukraine, and it seems that cracks are not only starting to form, but we could see them clearly from a mile away. Maybe this leads to the American government saying, man, you know, maybe the British were right when they send the long range missiles. Maybe we should send the long range missiles now. Ex escalate the aid. It's working. Uh, but one thing I wanted to point out was uh, a regiment of Belarusians that was formed in the Ukrainian military. Uh, now they fight by an idea of in order to liberate Belarus from the Lukashenko dictatorship, which has been extremely brutal in putting down protests and has a very authoritarian grip on the country, in order to save the country from Lukashenko, they are going to stop the invaders in Ukraine, and by liberating Ukraine, they can then move on to liberating Belarus. They even have a song about this, which is actually very catchy. I, I, I believe it's titled, By Liberation of Ukraine. Um, can we actually, uh, uh, it's actually a very, very good song. Um, I don't know if we should play it. We can maybe end the, uh, you guys go look at it yourself. It's a good song. I recommend it. Uh, but I wanted to play the statement they released in reaction to all the chaos that's going on, which was basically a call for open revolution or for people to at least prepare for revolution against Lukashenko's government. One second. Let me start from the beginning. <clears throat> Favorable conditions for the destruction of the dictatorship are rapidly approaching. This is the beginning of the end of the great tyranny. I appear to all Belarusian military personnel. Do not participate in Russia's internal conflict. The civil war does not concern us. Something else is important for Belarusians. The time is approaching when you will be faced with a choice. To carry out a criminal order or the oath that you took on loyalty to the Belarusian people. We have a huge reserve on the territory of Belarus, which includes active military. We have no clue if this is true or not. I would assume they are probably, let's say, exaggerating their numbers, but there are certainly people in Belarus that are already engaged in resistance efforts against the government by trying to undermine their support for the war effort in Ukraine, logistics lines, stuff like that. I don't know how deep the disconsent is in the military. We've heard reports about the uh, Belarusian military being completely out of step with Lukashenko when it comes to the war in Ukraine, but we, we we truly don't know, and we probably won't know until you know the whole thing kind of folds in on itself. If it folds in on itself, hopefully it does. Reserve military and ordinary citizens who are ready to act and liberate Belarus from the dictatorship and occupation. We will need people for decisive action. Prepare to join the self-defense units. Every city, every quarter, every street must be ready to control its own territory and maintain order. Soldiers, reservists, Belarusians, wait for our signal. The time of freedom is approaching. The great trial approaches. Okay, uh, last person I think we should probably check in with is Zelensky, the leader of Ukraine, who has some choice words about what's going on. He put out three statements. And so we're going to go through these three statements. Let's start with what he said 13 hours ago, um, while a lot of this was still in its early stages. Everyone who chooses the path of evil destroys himself, who sends columns of troops to destroy the lives of another country and cannot stop them from fleeing and betraying when life resists, who terrorizes with missiles and when they are shot down, humiliates, uh, humiliates himself to receive Shahid drones. Who despises people and throws hundreds of thousands into the war in order to eventually barricade himself in the Moscow region from those who he himself armed? 
For a long time, Russia used propaganda to mask its weakness and the stupidity of its government. And now there is so much chaos that no lie can hide it. And all of this is one person who again and again scare, uh, scares by the year 1917, although he is able to result in nothing else but this. So he's referencing 1917 because in Putin's statement in reaction to Prigozhin, he says, this is like 1917. We're getting stabbed in the back. Then it was communist. Now it's Wagner. He is saying that he's scared of 1917, but it's him who's causing it. Although he is able to result in nothing else but this. Russia's weakness is obvious. Full-scale weakness. And the longer Russia keeps its troops and mercenaries on our land, the more chaos, pain, and problems it will have for itself later. It is also obvious. Ukraine is able to protect Europe from the spread of Russian evil and chaos. We keep our resilience, unity, and strength. All our commanders, all our soldiers know what to do. Glory to Ukraine. It's really interesting. At the end of this, he says, we keep our unity. Basically, he's saying the Russians aren't unified. We're unified in our struggle. That's not only a message to the Ukrainian domestic audience because he tweeted this twice, once in Ukrainian, one in, once in English, but it's also a message to the international audience. Like, hey, we're united. Maybe you should support us. We're united. There's two more messages I want to go through quickly. Uh, man, they're all very long, though, but we got to go through it. This is the uh, uh, message he released. It's four minutes and 40 seconds long. We're just going to listen to the audio clip. I will do the thing where we read subtitles again for all the people who are just listening. Dear Ukrainians, all people of the world, good health to you. Today is a day when there definitely should be no silence, and we definitely need leadership. Today the world saw that the bosses of Russia do not control anything. Nothing at all. Complete chaos. Complete absence of any predictability. And it is happening on Russian territory, which is fully loaded with weapons. We all remember how the head of Russia threatened the world in 2021. He had some ultimatums. He was trying to show a kind of strength. The year 2022 showed that he confused his illusions and lies he was fed with strength. They in the Kremlin are capable of resorting to any terror, capable of resorting to any stupidity, but they cannot provide even 1% of the necessary control, and they are the real problem. In one day, they lost several of their million-plus cities and showed all Russian bandits, mercenaries, oligarchs, and anyone else how easy it is to capture Russian cities and probably arsenals with weapons. Now it is very important that no one in the world remains silent because of being afraid of this Russian chaos. All the action of the leaders now can be historic. Every word of journalists is worth its weight in gold. It is necessary to clearly name the source of the problem. And if someone in the world tries to ignore the situation, if someone in the world is under the illusion that the Kremlin is capable of regarding regaining control, this only postpones the problems until the next breakthrough of chaos, even more dangerous. We all know the solution. First, the world should not be afraid. We know that only our unity protects us. Ukraine will definitely be able to protect Europe from any Russian forces, and it doesn't matter who commands them. We will protect the security of Europe's eastern flank. Depends only on our defense. And this is why every menace... For oh. One second. Sorry, he speaks very fast. And that is why every manifestation of our of support for our defense is supported for your defense. Everyone in the free world. Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian guns, Ukrainian tanks, Ukrainian missiles are all that protect Europe from such marches as we see today on Russian territory. And when we ask to give us the F-16s or the attack them long-range missiles, we're enhancing our common defense, real defense. That is what is needed. Now is the time to provide all the weapons necessary for defense. Second, everything must be real. It's time for everyone in the world to frame frankly say that all of Russia's criminal actions against Ukraine were and are unprovoked, and we all have to focus exclusively on our common security priorities. NATO is not just a word or a set of formal promises. 
These are reliable guarantees for everyone that peace won't be destroyed. Without Ukraine, such guarantees are worthless. Already in July in the summit in Vilnius, oh my goodness, sorry, again, he talks very fast. Already in July at the sum summit in Vilnius, it is a historic chance for real decisions without looking back at Russia. Any nation that borders Russia really supports this. And the third, I will say it in Russian. The man from the Kremlin is obviously very afraid and probably hiding somewhere, not showing himself. I am sure that he is no longer in Moscow. He calls somewhere and asks someone. He knows what uh, he knows what he is afraid of because he himself created this threat. All evil, all losses, all evil. Wait, one second. All evil, all losses, all hatred. He himself who spreads it. And the longer he can run between his bunkers, the more you will all lose, all who are connected with Russia. What will we, Ukrainians, do? We will defend our country. We will defend our freedom. We will not be silent and will not be inactive. We will know how to win and it will happen. Our victory in this war will definitely be. And what will you do? The longer your troops stay on Ukrainian land, the more devastation they will bring to Russia. The longer this person is in the Kremlin, the more disasters there will be. And now I'm switching to my native language. Thanks to our soldiers. Thanks to everyone who is now beating the occupiers. Thanks to the Air Force for protecting our skies. Glory to Ukraine. We will defeat everyone. That wasn't the last statement he released. He released one more statement uh, uh, five hours ago. Um, oh, no, it's basically the same thing. Never mind. I thought this was a separate statement. And that's that. That's everything. That's most of the information that is necessary for you to know what's going on, as well as some small tidbits that I personally found interesting. So what we just saw is the weakest moment of Putin's regime, not only for the entire war, for, for more than a decade, ever since he first got in power in the midst of the Second Chechen War. This is the weakest he has ever been, with an armed rebellion on his territory, full of criminals, mercenaries, and, and hardened uh, uh, war criminals, a separate type of criminal, marching towards his capital after occupying a city of 1.1 million with basically no resistance. His regime looks weak. His regime might be weak. Because if it looks weak, you know, if there's smoke, there's fire, you know? It's the weakest moment of his regime. Anything can happen. We're in uncharted territory. Who knows how this deal is going to go? Maybe it'll be carried out. What details will be revealed about exactly what was negotiated by Lukashenko and Prigozhin and Putin, Gerasimov, Shoigu. Uh, everything, anything can happen. It really feels like we're at a point in this war where anything can happen. I have never feel, felt better for the prospects that Ukraine has. The war is far from won, and Putin is still in the Kremlin, and he's far from gone. But it really feels like we could see a light at the end of the tunnel, and this was the crack forming that hole for that light. Crazy, man.